I, I just arrived about five minutes ago, gentlemen, and I'm trying to find out just what the situation is. As far as I can tell, uh, we're going to deal in facts and not speculation. At the present time, we know that there are 27 people missing since about uh, uh, 4.15 yesterday afternoon. And it's our job and the job of the entire law enforcement community here in uh, Chowchilla uh, to find these youngsters and the bus driver and to make sure we take the responsible people into custody for uh, uh, this particular crime. At which point do you take over fully? I don't think it's a question of anybody taking over fully. Uh, as far as the FBI is concerned, uh, according to the federal law, there is a presumption that there is a federal violation after 24 hours have passed, and that gives us authority to conduct an investigation. Up to this point, uh, Sheriff Ed Bates has been doing an outstanding job, and we are going to continue to work with the Madera County Sheriff's Office, uh, with the California Highway Patrol, and any other law enforcement uh, agencies that are necessary in our efforts to solve the crime. So it's not a question of anybody being in charge. It's a law enforcement community activity, and we're going to be working together. As How many people, people have been involved from anyone? We have had no contact whatsoever. To my knowledge, as I say, I just arrived a little bit ago, and I was told you gentlemen of the press and ladies of the press uh, wanted, to, uh, wanted me to come out and say something, and so therefore that's why How I'm here. How many people do you have? Sir? I don't even know that. We have uh, quite a number, and uh, we have additional people coming in from the surrounding offices. Exact numbers I do not have at this time. Do you have any political act? Think? That's speculation, sir. You find Your guess is as good as mine at this point. It means you have no leads, right? We have nothing to go on at the present time, and that's what we're but trying no, to communicate from anyone. Not to my knowledge, no. Mr. Gillard, I understand a small purse was found and some clothes near Watsonville. Does that have any connection? I know nothing about uh, the find, finding of any purse. Do you know anything about it? No. Gentlemen, thank you very thank much. You if there is any development, we will let you know. Confirmed by the Alameda County Sheriff. It is confirmed by the Alameda County Sheriff that the children have been found in a quarry. That's all the information I have now. I could, if you give me five more minutes, I'll get some more details. How are they? Are they good away? It is reported that they are well. Some are, uh, have been exposed, but they're in good health. Are they all there? Yes. Did they get some people? I, if you give me five more minutes, I'll Did they get the people? Did they arrest the people who apparently are no, responsible? No, they are still looking for the captives of the children. Well, while I was down here earlier in the evening, uh, a woman called my home and asked for me, and my wife told her that I wasn't there and asked if there was any message that she could take for me. And the lady told her that uh, the children had been found, but it wasn't over, that there would be others. Have you told the FBI this? No, I have not. Are you going to tell them? Yes, I will tell them, but I did tell it to the Chowchilla police. They've been informed of it already. No, she, uh, she started, my wife says she started crying and said, I can't talk anymore. And uh, that generally is about the gist of the whole conversation. She hung up before. Did she say where the children were? No, she, she just said that the children had been found, but there would be others. What time was that? When, yeah, when was this? That would probably be between 9 and 10 o'clock this evening. Any idea where the call came from? None. Oh, None. Or other somewhere else. Was it a I, team? No, it was a lady. Why Mrs. Brown. Your, your children are safe now. They're on their way back here. What has been the worst thing, or the worst thing of this whole ordeal? I don't know. The worst thing of the whole ordeal. The fact that the children were frightened, they, that's the worst thing to me. Is it, what has it done to them? You know, what happened? Do you think something has happened to them? No, I don't mean physically, but what, what terror that they might have gone through. I was hoping, and still do that maybe they were sedated part of the time because the terror might not be so much for them. Did you have any reason to believe they were sedated or anything like that? No, not really. Uh, it was just a hope. Kind of. Somebody suggested that maybe they were, and I just grasped right onto that right away. That's great. They're, they're sedated. And from then on, I assumed that they were. I'm probably the weirdest of all of them because I keep asking myself, what's wrong with me? Either I'm in shock or something, but I never wavered from it. And I was down here, what, until about 8.30 tonight. And when I left, I told the constable and the, sher the sheriffs and all the ones that we knew, because we know most everybody around, 
So they're all right. You mark my words. They're going to find him, and they're going to be okay. I have no doubt of it. And that was my parting words as I jovial skipped along my way, and I felt that way all the time. I was a little, I was apprehensive, and I don't mean I was lighthearted. But I knew they were all right. Well, they're here, they've been fed, they've, they've been cleaned up, uh, they've been given clothing, we're talking to them. Uh, we, uh, I would generally the describe has, them in very high spirits. Yeah. Has, they talk to their parents? We ask who wants to be talked to next, and they all put up their hand, and they're very jovial, and they are just in fine spirits. What do you think has been the most uh, unusual thing about this whole story? That we, first we didn't know what happened to the children. Now we found out what happened to the children. The mystery is why, how. Do you think that's what captured the, the readers out there? I think the, the magnitude of it. I don't know if there's ever been 27 people kidnapped from a town, from anywhere, much less a town this size before ever in, the, in history that I know of. Was it hard for you to write? No, no, this is not hard to write. The, thing that, the only thing that was hard to write was to keep up with all the developments, but that's always so in a breaking story. The, uh, in other words, it'd be like a submarine conning tower, and then you'd go down into it in that manner and then back into it. And so apparently there down. was plywood and steel and then plywood over the top of that. And uh, In other words, they were, they were sealed in there to a degree and had yes. a there, there, Well, there is, there is ventilation in there. There's ventilation uh, Can you ducts in there. How, they got, how the word got out that these people were there? Well, they got out, and uh, uh, apparently they located the employee at Cal Rock. Yeah, and, uh, Who was this employee? The, the children. All of them got out. Who they was all got the out. employee? I don't have his name. What yeah. about the weapons? Uh, one's a, uh, the first weapon that was seen by the bus driver, one was a handgun, as he mentioned, as a small gun, and the other one was much larger. Whether it was a sawed-off shotgun, a sawed-off rifle, or maybe a full-size, we don't know. Was it obvious that these children were kept together the entire time, or were there, was there some point where they might have been separate? They don't know whether the two vans were together, because you couldn't see out of the vans. And what kind of vans were these? Can you describe them? Well, uh, one is a white van, possibly a Dodge. Both of them possibly Dodges. One is very dark, possibly black. The other one's white. Where are they right now? I wish I knew. <laughs> I, uh, are you ready to roll? I'm Leroy Tatum, superintendent of the Dairyland Union School District, John Chilla. I have with me the experiences that took place beginning the time that school was out last Thursday afternoon, relate his experiences until his presence this evening. So we were in a dark spot in that van. Just we got to this one spot, he run through some brush and stuff, and hear it scratching the pickup and stuff, the van. He left the cooler on for us for a while, and then he shut it off, and we thought we were going to suffocate in that for a while. The thing is all canvassed over. Then he unloaded us to the, to the bus driver first, so I got out. And he asked me my name and my age. Then he wanted my pants and my boots, so I had given them. Then he unloaded all the kids and asked their name and age. And they had this building all lined with wire, big old mesh wire. And they stood on the outside, we hear them cutting the wires, and the ceiling started to cave in and everything. We thought we were going to to let us out. So later in the afternoon there, we never did hear them cutting the wires or no more. So me and a couple of boys decided we'd better start digging. We were going to lose our lives there, same as getting, if we dug ourselves out. So. When we started to move this steel plate, we couldn't hardly move it because it had two great big old batteries on top of it. One battery, the batteries I couldn't even lift by myself. I got the kid to help me. We, we had to pile up mattresses and stuff, get up close enough to the hole to get it out. Then we got that plate up, got it and everything else to try to cool off and go back up and dig some more.
for their mamas and stuff, but I kept quieting them down. See, the guys wouldn't get mad at us. Stuff. Did you ever find out why they were doing this? No, sir. Any idea why? Okay, no, would sir. you please raise your hand and we'll be recognized. Mr. Ray, uh, may I recognize before you, Edward? Yeah. Mr. Ray, any children? No, sir. No, sir. Mr. Ray, uh, were you in some type of large constructed box? It was a large construction or an old truck body, I imagine it was, because it had bill with Where they were cutting wires this morning, I figured they were going to carry that whole top in on us. No, ma'am. They just, when we got out of the van, drove to the hole, they just asked me my name and my age. <laughs> He's still, uh, he's, uh, no, I wouldn't say intimidated, uh, but I, you know, he was obviously shocked to uh, suddenly um, to hear the words uh, life imprisonment without possibility of parole. He didn't know that already? We hadn't really discussed it. So for now, the judicial process for one of the Chowchilla kidnapping suspects is underway. And from early indications, it looks like it's going to be a long and hard legal battle. Bob Murphy, KCRA News, Chowchilla. Twenty-six school children and their bus driver are a year older this week than they were last year when their yellow school bus was commandeered in Chowchilla, allegedly by three young men from the San Francisco Peninsula. That case has still not come to trial and probably won't for some time. 
everything that we have uh, have presented on their defense uh, has been uh, the common accepted uh, defense procedure and there's been nothing that has been uh, bizarre or absurd and the idea that uh, anybody or any defense counsel could defend a, a charge of this magnitude without raising these uh, defenses and without being guilty of gross malpractice is absurd. Once this hearing is over with, will it be possible for these defendants to get a fair trial here? In my opinion, uh, it will not. That's why we sought to uh, exclude the public and the press from the hearing. The only issue at the non-jury trial that began today is whether Ed Ray and four of the Chowchilla school bus children, I'm sorry, school bus. The only issue at the non-jury trial that began today is whether bus driver Ed Ray and four of the Chowchilla school children suffered bodily harm during their kidnap ordeal of last July. If the judge finds that they did suffer bodily harm, the three defendants in this case will be sentenced to life in prison without possibility of parole. He very much like his brother seems to be extraordinarily naive about uh, the seriousness of the charges he faces, about the length of the uh, possible trial or pretrial motions in this kind of a case. I think he's, uh, at least after our conversation, a little bit more concerned about the problems with facing trial in a county like Madera and uh, a little bit more concerned about the kind of public feeling about a person who is even accused of this sort of a crime. I don't think he at any time has really grasped that and I think the main portion of our conference today was just to alert him to the seriousness of the allegations against him. As that's the only way we can determine if the kidnapping actually did do traumatic injury to the uh, children in question. We can't, we have to have before and after. Well, do you, do you feel happy or, or satisfied with Judge uh, Deegan's plan to keep everything confidential until uh, someone decides a particular child is going to testify? Are you going to have enough time to go over that case? I assume that he will give us enough time to go over the case before he sets it down for a formal hearing on those issues. Um, he said he would give us, uh, he would open it up if they chose to make an issue of the particular children, uh, whether they were injured uh, by the trauma. So therefore, he would, uh, he would give us adequate time. So I, I'm satisfied with it. Do that. you think it important to the defense to go into the medical history of each of the children involved in the kidnap? Yes, if they chose to uh, proceed as they have now uh, chosen to do so, yes. It'd be very definite, have to. Does that also include emotional problems as well as physical problems? Because that's a part of the prosecution's claim. Well, there's very little, as you, as, uh, you gentlemen who have seen the transcript uh, know, there's very little physical damage at all. And practically, it's, it's uh, non-existent. Everything has to be on a psychological basis. We think that under the California law, that it's sufficient to show the confinement both in a van that's on the surface of the of the uh, ground and an underground van for a period of around 26 hours where you have conditions of total darkness of uh, not enough food or water extremely hot conditions of panic among the children we think that actually under the california case law that should be enough to constitute bodily harm even if you don't have broken bones you do psychological damage well, I think it, it just depends on what you mean by psychological damage. The judges rule that we can't show psychological damage per se, but uh, we're trying to say that under the case law, when somebody can find someone uh, for that period of time in an underground uh, kind of a cavern, under those circumstances, that it does constitute bodily harm without having to get into the emotional effect. Mr. Yanowitz, the prosecution is maintaining that they can show that there was bodily harm because the fact of confinement in this case actually constitutes a kind of bodily harm. How do you argue against that? Well, we've cited uh, cases in our brief uh, to indicate that that, uh, in our opinion, no longer can be considered bodily harm under the uh, current Supreme Court interpretation of the phrase bodily harm. What about the actual injuries that Mr. Ray testified to today? 
Well, it is our position that this type of injury uh, does not constitute the serious bodily harm that's required to establish bodily harm under Penal Code Section 209. I've set that forth in the brief that we filed with the court. Thank you. concerned. I'd never been here before. The rest of them had. The children had never seen them before except for when they were kidnapped. So it was a it was a weird feeling. You made some comments about the security in the courtroom. What was yeah, I was I have been in law enforcement for nine years and it was unusual that the security was as loose as it was. Do you feel that this is going to bring back a little bit of the trauma of the kidnap for your children to see the three men that kidnapped them in the court today? Through your mind, sitting only a few feet from the men who kidnapped your son and daughter? Well, there was two bailiffs between me and them, so I couldn't have much feeling. You know, I, uh, what could you do but sit and listen to the judge? I was quite interested. What As was you going looked on. at them, did you feel anger or hatred? No, or I feel a pity for them. Not really. Not yeah. real actual or anything. Did you recognize the men? Yeah. What do I you think them. about them? Well, I don't know. <laughs> oh, you're all right. Well, not really. You say they would give you this funny look. What did that make you feel? Scared. Really? Are you afraid of those men, do you think? No. Do you think that any of your friends or you have been hurt for a long time because of it? No, not really. Why have you decided to go ahead with a trial in this thing all, since there's already been a guilty plea? Well, it's, it's not so much a decision to uh, go ahead. Uh, this was something that was charged and planned all along, namely to uh, have the issue of bodily harm decided. So it, it's not really a question of deciding to, to go ahead. I guess you might ask us why we didn't make a plea bargain and drop the bodily harm. Okay. But uh, we chose not to do that because we didn't think it was the right thing to do. The defendants have waived jury, so this is strictly before the judge, Judge Deegan. Will this be a full-fledged trial as far as you're concerned with all the evidence in the case brought forth? Well, not all of the evidence because, of course, now they've admitted that they're guilty. So the evidence will be primarily the evidence that relates to bodily harm, that is to say the, the uh, suffering that the uh, children went through and the various medical reports and so on. What kind of a penalty are you looking for? Well, if the judge finds that there was bodily harm for one or more of the victims, then it would be life. But all that is gone now. The reporters are gone. The telephones are gone. Oh, the tables are still here. They've moved the fire engines back in. But something else remains in this tiny town, something that's going to remain for a long time, the memories. Well, I think the city is beginning to get back to normal, uh, near normal again, but the worst guard we'll have is the apprehension, I'm sure, upon the parts of many people for a long time to come. And yesterday afternoon, I was talking to parents of one of the little girls that was abducted and we have some problems developing there with her. Now she's the first one that I've had any reports about uh, withdrawal symptoms or anything like this nature. A lot of them are scared to let their kids out of the house. I know my wife's got a girlfriend across town that says she won't let her kids out of the house. It's been like a nightmare. One day we woke up and all of these people were here and I don't know. Expressed to me here today was a feeling of hope. They said they hoped that someday their children will be able to ride these school buses again without fear. Bob Murphy, KCRA News, Chowchilla.